I'm going to read to you from the Gospel according to Mark. Gospel according to Mark. This is the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus came home to Nazareth, and his disciples were there as well. When, synagogue, when, when the Sabbath had rolled around, he began to teach in the synagogue, and there were many people there listening to him, and they were astonished. Where did he get this? This, this wisdom and such miracles performed by his hands. Isn't this the carpenter, son of Mary? Isn't he the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters? Do they not also here live among us? And they became scandalized by this. Jesus said to them, it's true, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own house. And Jesus could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their disbelief. Hmm. When I was in college, I, my, one of the courses I took kind of early, and I mean my freshman year, was intro to New Testament or something. And the primary subject of the class was something called the synaptic problem. I never thought that was a problem, but apparently they did. <laughs> it was a way of talking. It was, it was, it was the, the, the idea. So I come in from the Baptist tradition at this point. I was a Baptist, and I had that very simplistic view that God wrote the Bible. Well, the Bible's the Word of God. That meant God wrote it. So, I don't know. I guess I thought of like when Paul was writing a letter, Paul was just a stenographer. By the way, Paul had a stenographer. That, there's a name for them, and it's a very difficult name to say, omniunesis or something like that. Omniunesis. You can find it in an English dictionary, but it's a very, very difficult word to pronounce. Uh, but it was a person who would, it's your stenographer. And he had a stenographer because Paul, apparently his eyesight wasn't very good, so he didn't write well. And when he did write, he would write kind of big so he could see what he was writing. So he was dictating to somebody else who was writing this stuff down. That means that God is speaking to Paul and Paul is dictating it to now a stenographer. Is that how it goes? <laughs> you know? So, um, I, but you know, you didn't think about that. I came out of a tradition where you didn't think about it. It was just, well, that's just how it was. And, and so there couldn't be any possibility of there being a, a conflict, uh, an error. There couldn't be a contradiction anywhere. And then I come into seminary, and we're talking about the synoptic problems. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the teacher says, well, Mark's gospel is the first one written. And uh, then... Matthew and Luke are based on Mark plus something else that they, sh that they both had access to, which nowadays we call Q, just as a handle, because we, we don't actually have it as a document anymore. But there was some kind of thing, either 
it was either a, a oral tradition that was memorized word for word, or it was a written tradition that they were able to copy from, but there was Mark, and then there was this other thing, and then there was also some unique material that each one of them had. And I'm going, that's not how it happened. Matthew's Gospel is first. Everybody knows that. Mark's is the Reader's Digest version of Matthew, and Luke was doing his own thing. He's an independent researcher and came up with all this stuff on his own. And I, I would like argue with my teacher about this. He was very patient. <laughs> but I always thought to myself, well, that's okay. Because when I get to seminary, my Baptist seminary, we'll get this straightened out. So I went to seminary and took my class in Intro to Two Gospels. And my professor said, okay, Mark's Gospel was written first. And there was this thing called, uh, that we call Q, which was a secondary source for Matthew and Luke. So they're using Mark's gospel, and then they have, and I'm going, wait a second. <laughs> so here's how scholars got there. The way scholars got there was they, they simply laid the gospels next to each other in the original languages, and they compared them. And then they would keep track of every single time that um, all three of them agreed, every, in, like word for word identical, every single time where it would be like Matthew and Mark would agree, but Luke would be different. Every single time where Mark and Luke would agree, but Matthew would be different. And then what they couldn't really find were times when Matthew and Luke agreed and Mark was different. But then they could also find all this stuff that was not in Mark, but that Matthew and Luke agreed on. That's the Q stuff, this, uh, this unknown source. And, and so that's how they did it. it, was, it was, it's mathematical. This is way before computers. This was done by hand. Now, I'm the kind of guy who, if you were to say to me, hey, I'm just reading here in this article this really interesting thing about such and such. And then they would tell me, here's what it says. And then I'd say, oh, that really, sounds really interesting. Let me see it. Well, I just told you what it said. Don't you believe me? Um, OK, actually, it just helps me to like, confirm it for myself. It's, it, it's not a lack of trust in anyone else. It's actually how I learn. It also, somebody says, this is really delicious. My response is, let me taste it. Don't you believe me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So, so I, when I get that, I'm like, yes, okay, I get it. I let me taste it. Let me see for myself. It, but it was too much work to do this with the Gospels. I mean, it was really a lot of work. So I decided not to do the work because <laughs> I didn't. It was like, okay, I, I'm just going to trust you guys on this one. But this is the passage that convinced me, and it convinced me for a slightly different reason. So I have to explain to you that once you understand that they're using this mark as a source, then there's another step. So that's called source criticism. That's the fancy name for it. Then there's this other thing that happens that if you look at Matthew changes it, now you can ask the question, why does Matthew change it? You can use that as a window into Matthew. And that's known as redaction criticism. So I was actually doing redaction criticism. I was looking at the changes. And, but when you do that, and you're like looking at Matthew, and you go, why did Matthew change it? It sometimes helps you see something that was in Mark that you missed before. And that's what happened to me. And it was this story. Because in this story, it starts out with Jesus coming in. He's preaching. He's doing his thing. Um, and then... The crowd starts to get a little bit, at first they're like, wow, this is really cool. And then somebody goes, wait a second, I know this guy. This is, he, he built my garage. I hired him to build my garage. So carpenter probably does not mean guy who makes furniture, but more like guy who builds garages, general contractor. So I, I, I know this guy. Where, did, where does he get this from? I hired him to do my garage. How come he suddenly, a, and, and the miracles? And then somebody says, wait a second, I know this guy, this is Mary's son. Okay, so at, that's fine, right? Is this not, so the text in Mark says, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Then I'm reading in Matthew. You know what Matthew says? Is this not the son of the carpenter? Is not his mother named Mary? So that's the change. The change causes me to go, what is it about Mark that Matthew needed to change? And I look back at Mark and I went, oh. Right? See, culturally speaking, people are named child of their father. So, for example, in Russian, a boy whose father is John, Ivan, is named Ivanovich. Mikhail Ivanovich. And a woman whose father is John is Ivanova. You know, Natasha Ivanova. 
That's how they do it. So that means son of and daughter of. So Johnson, John, daughter. Same thing used to be true in like Norwegian. Oli son and Oli's daughter. That was how you said it. And then later on what happened is that these became a family name that passed on generationally. But at the time of Jesus, you were the son of your father and your father was the son of your grandfather and that's how you did it. No one was the son of their mother. So when they're saying that Jesus is the son of Mary, they're calling him a son of a mother. Now, I hate to use the word bastard in church, but that's what they're saying. Wait a second, isn't this the carpenter Mary's bastard kid? Or at least what's, what you can imply from what they say. So they might be saying, isn't this Mary's son, if you know what I mean? Or maybe they're like straight out calling him Mary's bastard. Either way, Matthew picks that up and is like, you can't say that! <laughs> and so he fixes it. And Jesus now responds to this with this great parable about, you know, yep, prophet never has honor in their own hometown or even in their own house. And then comes this really remarkable statement. It says, and, and he was unable to do any mighty works there, any miracles, other than laying his hands on a few people and healing them. So then I'm back in Matthew. And Matthew changes it again. And I realize Matthew is going, you can't say that! Because what is it that Matthew says? And Jesus did no mighty miracles there, did no mighty works, did no miracles there, other than laying his hands on a few people and healing them. And Mark is, he was unable to. Unable. And of course, Matthew's like, he's the son of God. Our belief or disbelief is independent of what God does or doesn't do, so you can't, theologically, you can't say that, but Mark is actually getting at something which is true in a personal, uh, existential way. That is, our, and I don't want to use the word unbelief, because that's not really the right word, our disbelief is a wall that cannot be penetrated, that we will not allow God's grace, even God's miraculous grace, to work in our lives if we refuse to believe that that's how God works. We shut ourselves off. These people look at Jesus and all they see is the guy who built their garage and who was the, um, you know, son of Mary, if you know what I mean, and that is not how God works. There is no room for God to work that way. How dare he have those miracles? How dare that? That is not how God works. And they shut themselves off from the work of God, the grace of God. There were only a few people there who probably weren't all that convinced themselves, but rather than being disbelievers, they were merely unbelievers. Catch the distinction? I don't really think there is, but I'm at least open to the possibility. <laughs> Those folks? So it's weird. I, what my argument for Christians is don't be a disbeliever, but it's okay to be an unbeliever. <laughs> By which I mean it's okay for us to be unsure. You know, we, we, we have all of these claims about how God works. It's okay for us to be unsure if that is, in fact, how God works. Maybe we got it wrong, but at the same time, I'm open to the possibility. I'm open to God doing the unexpected, powerful, mighty, I wasn't ready for it thing. I'm open to that. I want to be that kind of, you know, unbeliever. Somebody said, for the true believer, no proof is necessary. For the skeptic, no proof is sufficient. Well, the skeptics are the disbelievers. And the true believers are simply those who swallowed the whole fish. In between is where real faith lies. Because real faith is willing to step into a cloud of uncertainty and to say, let me see if that is in fact true. And in this place, just a few people were willing to have themselves experience the grace of God from the touch of Jesus. Can you find a prayer of response? Let's pray that together. Save me, almighty God, from disbelief. Save me from that stubbornness of mind that will not be persuaded differently. Save me from that attitude of antagonism which shuts me off from renewal and grace, power and transformation. Let me be among those who receive your touch and receive your healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now may the Lord God bless you and keep you. The face of the Almighty be upon you and may God grant you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Would you be free from your burden? 